Isn't a glass of water so refreshing? But I would ask, anyone who's watching, please don't drink water during my presentation, because as chemistry states, concentration decreases with water. My father has been the superintendent of my local Northern Ohio hometown water and wastewater plant for the last 40 years. For me, that meant I grew up around anaerobic process jokes before I could read. Hey, have you heard the one about the amoeba who was sad? His parents split. I know, not great, but eh. My father was much like the Lorax. He loved protecting the natural world and improving how humans interact with biological systems. As superintendent, he implemented a number of projects to protect the natural wetlands and improve drinking water systems. In our little one mile square town, he planted 6,000 native trees to support reclamation. He even regularly went up against real estate investors and other developers in situations where regulation wasn't being followed and he needed to. So for me, that meant that I grew up around trenches. I grew up around anaerobic uh, digesters and clarifying tanks. That's how in high school I decided to follow in his footsteps and study what I would consider one of the most important things in my life, which is getting into water. Water is one of the most pressing environmental issues today. Water is what we would consider a wicked problem. Water is a wicked problem because it's an intractable issue that involves a multitude of stakeholders. You know, other examples include climate change, uh, poverty, homelessness. So what defines a wicked problem? Well, there are a few aspects of it. So wicked problems are difficult to clearly define, first and foremost. Second, they're often multi-causal with many interdependencies. Third, they often have failed attempts to address the problem, which lead to unforeseen consequences. Fourth, they typically lack a clear solution. Fifth, they involve human behavior change. Six, they really sit conveniently within the responsibility of a single organization. And finally, they often are defined by chronic policy failure. And water hits all of these. Here's why. First, water has an economics issue. In the next uh, 20 years, it is expected that water will have a 40% gap in supply and demand. Today, over 2 billion people live in high stress areas. If you live in one of those areas, you probably know what I'm talking about. Having lived in and out of Southern California for the better part of the last decade, I can commiserate. Second, water has an infrastructure problem. In the US alone, we need over a trillion dollars the next 25 years to restore underground pipes, another half trillion to maintain drinking water systems, and another quarter trillion to maintain wastewater systems in place. And relatively speaking, the US is in a better place than globally. If you live in Latin America, Asia, or Africa, the cost compared to GDP can be staggering. The World Bank estimates that in the next 10 years, investments in water and wastewater need to triple if we're gonna be able to meet the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 6 by 2030, which is a lot. Third, pollution. Pollution is a major problem. 80% of discharged wastewater is untreated, typically due to lack of infrastructure or technical expertise. Severe pathogen pollution affects a third of all rivers in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. This affects hundreds of millions of people. Waterborne diseases, for example, cholera, remain widespread in developing countries and kill over 3 million people globally each year. Fourth, Water has an equity issue. Water is generally undervalued in advanced economies and particularly undervalued for heavy water uses such as multinational corporations. So for people in places like Bangladesh, this means that water resources go to making American textiles and, and the local people are forced to drink dirty water. And do you know who's affected most by that? Those that are most of it vulnerable. Globally, women and children spend over 200 million hours each year collecting water. This phenomenon is true throughout the world. The poor are most likely to be affected by water issues. And finally, water is intrinsically linked to climate change. As our planet continues to increase in global temperature, storms will continue to damage systems. Uh, people will 
have issues related to drought and competition will become more scarce. Climate change will only exacerbate these issues. We're already seeing this in places like California, Colorado, the Gulf and internationally. Climate change will continue to lead to problems of pollution, equity and infrastructure. So the question is, how do we solve the issue of water? Well, when I was a kid and I wasn't running around wastewater plants, I was dreaming up entrepreneurial ideas. My best friend Cody and I used to collect golf balls from the woods near our local golf course and sell them to people. My father, despite being one of our better golf ball customers, often was skeptical of all my sort of ideas. When I was 16, I was fascinated by flipping houses and tried to convince my parents to lend me money so I could purchase an apartment complex. They politely declined. And one of the reasons that my father was so hesitant to my entrepreneurial ventures is because he had seen firsthand how profit motive often comes at the cost of environmental and social protection. When a company willfully ignores their copper discharge into the sewer system, he was the guy who had used taxpayer dollars to fix the issue. And so as I learned about the concept of environmental sustainability, I realized that businesses do oftentimes ignore the cost of environmental protection. That's why we have super, super fun sites that are you know, dating back to the 1970s and 80s, such as Woburn, Massachusetts, that have cost over a billion dollars to a company dumping chemical contaminants into a local water supply. But the question I asked was, does it have to be that way? So in college, I studied the intersection of business and the environment. The question I kept asking myself is, is it possible to protect the planet while enabling businesses to create significant economic value? Can I be a staunch capitalist while at the same time caring deeply about the environment? And there isn't an easy answer. It's a wicked problem. The pursuit of solving this wicked problem has taken me all over. I've cut through the jungles of the Amazon. I've started mission-driven companies. I've worked for Fortune 100 companies. And what I've learned in these experiences is simple. We can solve the wicked problem of water. All we have to do is we have to align business incentive with water issues. So let's first start with business incentives. When the Clean Water Act was first created, it was a regulation meant to protect citizens from business malfeasance. But the business community has grown substantially from the 1950s. Originally, companies only focused on water issues to maintain compliance and be in line with regulations such as CERCLA or the Clean Water Act. This is what I would call the compliance or management phase. But then once companies became compliant with regulations, there were awful social pressures from local or international communities to do more, right? So organizations such as the World Wildlife Foundation, Nature Conservancy, or the NRDC were pushing these companies to think more about how they could become stewards of the environment or how they could think more about the non-financial components um, that are important to those sort of companies. And there are typically two reasons why companies think about stewardship as part of what they do. The first being the people who run these companies live in local communities and they're not inherently evil people. They talk with other people. They don't want to be hated. This is what I would consider to be a moral obligation. The second one is, is risk mitigation. Successful companies mitigate risk better than unsuccessful ones. So if companies spend time engaging with stakeholders, learning from them, talking to community leaders, talking with government officials such as my father, then oftentimes they're able to identify potential issues before they happen. This phenomenon was first documented by Goodpaster and Matthews in 1970s as the stakeholder theory. The problem with risk management, or what I call a social license to operate, is that businesses try to control cost, and risk management is typically a cost control which makes sense. If you're a business, then you're trying to increase your revenue, decrease your costs to be able to make a profit. So if we truly want to align business incentive with water issues, we need to move to what I would call a social license to grow model away from a license to operate model. This means that companies that are interested in water need to make it a business enabler and a driver. To put it in perspective, companies spend less than 1% of revenue on risk mitigation activities. Those same companies spend over 3% on technology and over 7% on marketing or sales activities at the same time. 
So if we were to change our thinking from making water a risk mitigation activity to make making water a sales and marketing activity, we could potentially think about water and generate more money, three to seven times X more money in investment dollars. So why don't we do it? Well, as I noted earlier, there are some issues with water. First of all, we undervalue it. Second of all, there's an equity issue. Third, it's complex and takes a lot of collaboration across stakeholders. So basically everyone would love to solve the issue of water, but the capital available is limited. But, you know, it's interesting. There are parallels in history here. If you look at the venture capital space or the innovation sector, it had similar issues not that long ago. It may not feel that way today because of the number of high profile startups, but it's true. It really had some issues. So let's look back in history. If you look back, the first venture capitalists were actually whalers in New England in the 18th and 19th century. The reason for this is that whaling expeditions typically took two to five years to return a profit, had a high amount of risk involved, and took large amounts of upfront capital. But if they did return, they had long tail returns with high profit margins. This model repeated itself throughout history, looking at the textile industry and eventually moving into the technology space. In 1946, the American Research and Development Corporation was, was founded, and that was kind of the beginning of the venture capital space. From those humble beginnings, the innovation uh, space really started looking very differently and rapidly different. You know, for instance, you see a number of high profile cases today, whether that's Intel, Apple, eBay, Amazon, Google, all of those were part of the venture capital space that grew rapidly. So, what if we could do the exact same model with global water issues? What if water became a driver of technology innovation? What, what then, what could we do? Well, I think we could rapidly increase the pace, scale and business incentives to solve the wicked problem of water. To do this, we need to build an innovation community. So what is an innovation community? Well, Innovation communities or ecosystems are a common topic in the startup world. They're well studied and they are attempted to be replicated all over the world. Obviously the most notable one is in Silicon Valley in San Francisco, but startup communities have all the same players as wicked problems. They have entrepreneurs, investors, the private sector, non-governmental organizations and the public sector. But what they do is they foster a community that has specific supportive activities that could potentially solve wicked water issues. For instance, they focus on inclusivity. They look at things from a non-zero sum perspective, meaning it's less about winning and losing. It's very mentorship driven. They typically have porous boundaries or they don't focus on a single state or nation. They give people the opportunity to have mastery, autonomy, and purpose. And finally, most importantly, they enable people to experiment and fail quickly. So if we're able to apply these concepts to wicked water problems, I think we can solve the issue of water. And we've already started seeing it. There are a few notable examples. For instance, AB InBev's 100 Plus Accelerator, the Nature Conservancy and Techstars, 101010, and a few others. These are focused on investing in innovative water companies, whether they're seed or growth stage. But truly, more could be done. Currently, the water space still has classic, classic startup issues. For instance, they have a bias against newcomers. If wastewater plants are only being built every 20 to 40 years, typically you have a lot of legacy that happens there. Second, it's a risk adverse culture. The, the water and wastewater industry is predicated on security. And so that's one of those things that they have been typically very risk averse. And finally, there's an incredibly strong reliance on the public sector. Over 80% of drinking water systems in the US are owned by governmental bodies. And this is probably where my father, a public servant, is probably cringing. It's not to say that I think we should remove government from water utilities. In general, public utilities are one of the strongest institutions of the US government. However, if we want to innovate in the water sector, we need to change the culture of risk aversion and enable new concepts to experiment and fail. So how do we do that? Well, there's no silver bullet to solving water issues, but we need to build innovation communities to rapidly accelerate the failed attempts to solve water issues and determine what is best, the best path forward. These communities need to bring together different stakeholders to focus on wicked water problems. 
and we need to overcome the classic problems of the water sector to accelerate innovation. But the good news is we're starting to see it. In the Colorado River Basin, I'm lucky enough to work with people who are creating water funds that are focused on early stage companies to solve local and global water issues. I've been working with uh, government organizations trying to digitize utilities, Fortune 100 companies who are trying to think differently and move away from stewardship and more to water strategy so they can do more with it. You know, we're at the dawn of the age of the digital water space. We're seeing utility companies, we're seeing developers, and we're seeing people really focus on new technology that will accelerate the digitization of the water space. In my recent research and work, I've been lucky enough to engage with a number of these cutting edge technologies trying to solve major water issues. They're using satellite imaging, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, remote sensors or robotics to creatively solve issues. And to this segment, I say, the future is here. But at the same time, there are entire places on earth that have even started thinking about digitization of water. And truthfully, this is where many of the water issues exist today. To this group, I say, we can do more. You know, I've spent my life at the intersection of sustainability and innovation. To my fellow entrepreneurs, they often ask, why don't I do something more lucrative? And to my fellow environmentalists, they ask, how can I be thinking about economics when the world is burning and people are being killed. And unfortunately today, both are correct. However, if we're able to align economic value creation with planetary needs, I do believe that we can solve these issues. We have much work to do, but I'm confident in the ingenuity of humanity. You know, I hope my father watches this talk today. Parts of him will make him happy. Parts of him will make him cringe. That's where we are today. There's so much potential to solve the wicked problem of water, but also so much pain. To that I say, cheers. Let's all become water innovators.